Hello friends, today we're going to be talking about the Lomomatic 110, 110 camera from Lomography. See this guy right here. Now, pretty excited to have this camera. It's a really special camera for me just because it's a lot of fun and it's a brand new production 110 camera. So that's going to be a lot of fun. The thing I like about these types of cameras as you check it out is just the size, the pocketability, all those things. Now, there are lots of great cameras out there in the 110 format. This one happens to be on the relatively small size, kind of around the Agfomatic, like 3000 or 2000 or 30, uh, 3008, you know, that series. But there's also an even smaller one, the Roly A110, uh, 110, the Roly A110. And I might even pick up one of those. I never had one, but, you know, they're supposed to be pretty cool and excellent. So when we talk about 110 film, we've actually got to talk about this little cartridge right here. And the thing that we think mostly about this cartridge is a small negative. That's the paper leader at the end. As you can see, what makes this film interesting, we see that it's exposed, but this little cartridge can actually be exchanged for a different type of film while you're in the middle of a roll. Uh, you do lose whatever frame number you're on right there, but you basically burn one frame, lose one frame, just to switch out different film throughout the shooting process. So you could have 15 shots on this 24 shot cartridge and then switch over to this turquoise and shoot a few there and then switch back. And every time you switch the film, you just burn one frame. That's kind of a neat concept if you think about it. Anyway, 110 film has seen a resurgence uh, ever since Lomography started making Lomochrome, Lomocolor, and brought it back to life a few years ago. It had such a big resurgence that they came up with this Lomomatic 110, and that's what we're looking at today. Now, I shoot a lot of different type of film. I used to talk about it a lot on the channel. I don't necessarily talk about it a lot now. Sometimes I talk about these different awesome flash by Godox. This is the Lux Junior on top of my Olympus 35 RC. In any event, um, I really enjoy film. I think film is so great. And so that's why we're talking about this camera today. Now, as you can see, I've got this film, which is the first roll of film I have shot on the Lomomatic 110, and it has yet to be developed. I will be developing that here shortly. But as such, I want to tell you up front, I'm not going to show you any film negatives or scans in this video. There's a specific reason for it. It's because if you shot this roll of film, just like I did, then you wouldn't be able to see them immediately, just like I can't. So I want you to have some anticipation for the next video that comes out. Now, there are a few of you out there that just rolled out and said, man, I'm not going to watch, wah, 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 go cry me a river, because that's half the fun of the film, or waiting for film, is actually the anticipation. And yes, I could develop this tonight and show it to you, but you're gonna have to stick around for another video for that. Okay, that being the case, let's actually talk about this camera uh, in a different way. It comes in two different colors. I got the anodized aluminum. The difference is between this one and the all plastic one is that this is a shell of aluminum over the plastic body. So I think if you were going to get one, if you were thinking you were buying the all aluminum one because it was going to be more sturdy, I don't know that that's the case because it's not made out of all aluminum. The frame isn't all aluminum. It's just a shell over top of the plastic frame. Now, to what extent that actually changes how it feels in your hand and the sturdiness, I don't know. This particular model right here feels real nice. I don't think that it's going to break through use, but I wouldn't want to drop it too many times and I definitely wouldn't want to sit on it. That's something I can say about it. I waited several months before I bought this since its release, and I did that because I wanted to make sure that there weren't any production issues. Now, some people said in the first batches that they got, they had an issue with the film specifically advancing every time you would take a photo. And sometimes they'd have to move the film and ratchet it in and out once or twice. And I've got to tell you, I've had to do that a couple times, but it's nothing more than what you would expect. I mean, it's it's normal. It uses a metal sprocket ratcheting system which you can see right there okay i don't know if you guys can see that i hope you can there's a little metal sprocket sprocket right there that ratchets the film you know ratchets it right here and that may skip or get bound up or something i don't necessarily know what happens to it but i can tell you that that shooting process has not been anything that's caused me any kind of loss of sleep the next thing i want to talk to you about this is something else that i heard 
people chit-chatting about. And that was that the shutter button, which is right here, is mushy. And I got to tell you, yeah, it's really, really mushy. Okay. If you were to think about this shutter button, uh, you would need to think about it as maybe a three-step shutter button. So if you think about a film camera, uh, it's just one consistent press and then it clunks, great. If you think about a digital camera where you've got a two-position shutter button, half press to focus, then full press to take a picture, think about this shutter button as a three-step shutter button. What's actually happening is the first half press is going to open the aperture to the proper size, which you'll hear a click. The second half press is going to be the flash and the shutter at the same time. And the third half press, as you go through and continually press that, is going to be what allows the little mechanism inside to engage so that you can cycle through. What I mean is, if you haven't shot the film and it is engaged and you've only half pressed the shutter, so the mechanism has gone through the shutter release and the aperture, but you haven't pressed fully so that it's, I guess, pressed another lever in there. It won't allow you to close it because <laughs> it thinks it's still halfway through the process. Some people have reported that as an issue. Uh, I haven't. It doesn't seem to be an issue. It just seems to be a quirk of this camera. Now that we know that, let's actually look at how the camera works. I'll talk about some of the features later. But right now I want to talk about how this camera works specifically with no film because I think that's the most interesting thing to us out there. Let's have a look inside and as you can see inside we've got uh, our film plane where the film is actually exposed and then we've got our spool where the cartridge goes. I can show you this right now because it's pretty simple. See? It goes right in like that. Okay. Now that we see that I'm going to go ahead and ratchet the film so that it's ready to go. We're open right here, but I also want you to see the shape of the shutter. We're going to do that by turning on a little backlight for you. Okay, that's all you're going to need. I know you may not be able to see it, but we'll be able to see it in there. Now that we've got the film or the camera open and it's ready to go, I'm going to half press and full press the shutter, but it won't open. It won't release because it thinks there could be film in here and it's not closed as well as um, not ready to take an image. Almost it thinks that you haven't advanced the film. So I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to press the multiple exposure lever up and you heard it click. Now that it's clicked, I'm over here on uh, just the regular 200, whatever speed you want. And now I'm going to press the shutter and you'll see it. Good. Notice it was in the shape of a small diamond. That's because we're on daytime. Daytime is f5.6. f5.6 looks a little bit like a diamond. I switched over to night, and now we're going to do that whole process. Ratchet the film, turn the multiple exposure, hear the click, and now watch. You might have been able to pick up those three distinct different sounds. Let's try that one more time. I don't know if you heard that, but if you did, there were three distinct clicks right there. Now, we've got a bulb mode button that we can press, which we'll do right now. Multiple exposure again. I'm going to press the bulb button. Notice the bulb is now highlighted up here. And now you'll be able to see, as long as I hold down, you'll see the opened shutter right there. Now, if you decide to look at the different apertures while the shutter is open, you're going to find a problem. Ask me how I know. I did switch this with my other hand while it was open and it screwed up something in here until I ratcheted it a few times and it caught back up. So do not do that. Okay. On a regular film camera, you can hold the bulb open and change the aperture on the lens and it won't have any problem. It did have a problem with mine. I hope it's not screwed up forever. I don't think it is. I think it's fine. But we were just looking at the night mode aperture. We'll do that one more time. Tap bulb again. Notice it's a full circle. This is f2.8 for the 110 film format. Okay. Now I'm going to switch over to the day. Day is really f5.6. Ratchet. Turn the multiple exposure. That way it clicks it so it allows us to release the shutter now. And there we go. I forgot to push the bulb button. So let's do that now. 
And now you'll get to see, there you go. There's that little diamond. I'm sure you can see it in there. Okay. Now that we've looked at this all the way around, I want you to know there is something else interesting that it will do. If we just look and see on F5.6, I'm gonna keep it on F5.6 and I'm gonna put it on ISO 100, right? So it thinks that there's a, a slower film in there. I want you to watch just how long the automatic exposure keeps the shutter open in the F5.6 or day mode. That was about half of a second, okay? Now, when we add the flash, which we'll talk about the flash in a moment, but when we add the flash, which for some reason seems to be harder than it should be for me right now. Okay. And then we power the flash on. I'm putting it in the night mode right now, even though I've got my day mode aperture selected, that won't matter to the exposure of the flash. You can use them independently. I guess a better way to say that is the camera recognizes that it's not really day or night. That's just a suggestion to the user. You should know that day is 5.6, night is 2.8. So really the aperture is just uh, telling it to include in its exposure calculation from that little exposure meter right there, that little cell, it's saying that the aperture currently is at 5.6. And I want it at 5.6 so you can see the difference in time that it was just a moment ago to now. So about a half a second as compared to one, two, three, about maybe an eighth of a second. You guys saw that click open and close. So the flash is being included in the exposure calculation. Now that we've done that, I'm gonna talk about this door. This little door right here is a plastic door and it sits inside the tracks as you close. And the hinge mechanism right here, the little part that is spring retained kind of sucks to open and close the film. I don't really care for it that much and it feels a little Wonky, flimsy isn't the right word, but I don't know. Flash is still on, so we'll go ahead and turn it off for now. And it is using, I'm using the lithium CR1 or CR2 battery. And that just goes in right there. I don't really care for how this battery cover fits in. It feels like it could pop off, possibly. But just the friction of my fingers can move it. So... That's something that might require a piece of tape at some point. Let's have a walk around for the camera. For those of you that want to know, you cannot see any frame lines inside. There are none. Okay, no frame lines. And the frame that you're seeing is the box that you're going to see. Now, what they have done to the viewfinder is they have given it a vignette around the edges. So there's a circle that you can see through directly and then a vignette, which is in the actual lens on the side that we're facing, not on the front. And at first I wondered why they did that. Why did they frost or vignette that circle? And then it made a lot of sense. When you look through there, there are parts of the camera that you would see on the inside that just may be interesting to you, but probably don't look very good. And that small vignette or frosting that they've done of the viewfinder on the viewer side actually helps make it less distracting. It helps you focus on the front element, which is where you're going to be framing, which is great. As we look over here, this is where you'll see your film. And as the film goes in, you can see the film you're using and the number of exposures that are left, which is really cool. I'll take that back out because once the film is exposed all the way through, it does not appear that you can close it again all the way. That's been my experience. Over here to the side, we're going to see our strap as well as our focus. Now, there are people over here that are talking about this zone focus as a difficulty, as in 
uh, it doesn't focus well and you get unsharp type of images. And I'm sure that's true. But you have to think, with a zone focus camera, no matter which one it is, you have to be good at choosing the distance that you're looking at. So if you're not good at judging distance, if you have trouble parallel parking, if you can't hang a photo level, right, like a picture frame, those are things that you'll have to work on because zone focusing uses all of those perceptive skills. So I'm not saying that I'm great at zone focusing for any other reason than I can look and judge about 8 or 10 feet pretty easily, 3 feet as well. These are not feet, though. These are meters. So let me share with you exactly where we should be considering uh, in imperial units. 0.8 of a meter, that's one foot in yellow, roughly five feet. It's actually four feet, 11.8 inches, but whatever, five feet in the red. Three feet or three meters should be closer to 10, 12 feet. Actually, it's really right at 10 feet. And then infinity. So the reality is if someone is about thigh up to waist up in your frame and you see the head at the top of the frame and their thighs or just at the waist in the middle of the frame or the bottom of the frame, then uh, you're about five feet. If they're a little bit further so the whole person is head to toe in your frame where the head is at the top of your frame and the feet are pretty much at the bottom of the frame, you're roughly at 10 feet, three meters. And if they're anywhere further back than that, if you're using people as your guide, like I just suggested, then you're at infinity. And if you want to take a selfie, this is where I think they kind of screwed up Lomomatic. This is a perfect selfie film camera. And one foot is too close. Five feet is too far away. Most people's arm's length is roughly three feet. So we, uh, we're going to kind of fail on any selfies that we take with this if we want sharp focus. Focus will also depend on depth of field from your aperture. But using your f5.6 is where you're going to get the sharpest images throughout the range. f2.8 will be a little bit more difficult because it'll be having a little more shallow depth of field and you have to be much closer to the exact uh, measurement, the exact distance. Anyway, moving on forwards, we have our lens right here. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but in the lens, the lens has a little marker on the frame line. It's how you twist the lens on. And if you can see, maybe you can that little marker moves. So you can actually see the lens moving in the different focusing, just like if you were to focus a lens by changing the slider here, you can actually see it move there. Very cool. This is where we look. Now coming over to this side, this is where our flash will go. Let's show you what that looks like. Now you've got three different versions of this unit. You can get the plastic versions, which are the Golden Gate, which to be quite honest with you, I think after holding this one, although I like it a lot, I think if I was going to buy it again, I'd buy the Golden Gate version, which is the all plastic version, as well as uh, the with the flash. It's like $119. This one's $149 or $59. Um, I have not held a Golden Gate version, but after holding this one, uh, realizing that it doesn't even have a steel frame or a ZMAC frame or something, and it's just a plastic frame, I don't know if I got anything extra. And sometimes when you have a metal frame over or metal shell over a plastic frame, Sometimes, and this is my speculation, This I have no evidence for this. I'm just sit, stating this. I've expected that I might prefer the full thickness of plastic rather than a thinner plastic frame to support this metal shell. Maybe I would have just preferred a completely thick plastic uh, frame. In any event, on this side is where you're going to see the screw for, of course, the flash and the flash pins, which is pretty nice. So we see those flash pins right there. I think that this is like a really great size. The lens is protected, works well, feels good. And then when you want to put on the flash, the flash actually goes on pretty neatly. I like the flash. Now, the flash is a little fiddly, not tricky, because the screw down knob doesn't seem to stick out enough for me. And there is no pin on the front to help it stay in position. So you can see... Can you see it wobbling right there? Like you can see daylight through it. Let's do this. Can you see the purple come through? Yeah. So it's a point of contention about using the flash because you've got a levering action right here. And that just seems like at some point in time it could break. I don't want it to break. So be careful with it. Uh, with the flash, we have flash off. We have flash nighttime, which is your wider aperture. We have flash daytime, which is uh, your smaller aperture, which means 
that these suggestions that it's telling you is they're saying, use flash night with night and use flash day with day. But the reality is the flash is either full power or half power. That's really what we're doing, right? So if we know our apertures at 5.6 and 2.8, and we know our guide number of the flash, which I don't know, and it does not say here, I'm going to expect six. I think the guide number is probably six. Then we can know that we're full power is six, half power is three, and you can choose whichever one of those you wish to use based on your own preference, right? So you can get a little bit more manual style photography just by knowing what's actually happening. This is an extremely capable little camera, and I cannot wait to share with you this film that I shot with it. It'll be a great story to go along with this film because you'll follow along with me and my son on a day that we bought presents for my wife. How great is that, right? Awesome. Guys, I want to thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video and can't wait till we get back to the Lomomatic 110. Bye for now.